Good evening. How are you tonight? Welcome to the uh, third Tuesday of the odd month, also known as the Applied Project Manager Speaker Forum. <clears throat> Is there anyone here for the first time? Oh, fantastic. Look at all these new people. Well, welcome. So the only way I know that I'm supposed to be here is it's the third Tuesday of the odd month. So I'm your host tonight. My name is uh, Rene LaBelle. I'm an alum of the project management program here, graduated about 10 years ago. Tonight we have uh, a very interesting group. Um, usually we only have one speaker, but uh, they're going to do self-introduction. But we have John, our technical analyst. We have Susan and uh, Claude. I didn't say that right. Close. Claude. So pretty close. Claude, excuse me. <laughs> I'm recovering from a cold. <clears throat> anyway, the, uh, the, the one little housekeeping thing that I wanted to do is tonight is going to be very interactive. And for the benefit of the video recording, we really want to make sure that we get your voice on the microphone. Uh, even though you can hear, uh, even if I take the mic away from my voice right now, you can hear me. Uh, but the video recording will go, will go dead. So it's really just something that, and I'll be walking around with the mics. <laughs> And we have an extra mic, and we'll just sort of pass mics around, and it's just an on-off button. So uh, as, an, as an introduction before we get started, uh, Susan asked me to just sort of share a little bit about my experience with ethics. And uh, whenever I get put in an ethical dilemma, uh, my stomach starts to turn and going, oh boy. Um, the things that flash through my mind is like, OK, whose interests do I represent here? I mean, uh, of course, there's mine. And there may be my employer or somebody that I'm contractually obligated to, and and it goes on from there. And the one thing that the one thing that I would share with on uh, my experience with ethical dilemmas is sometimes doing nothing is the best choice. But I'm not. I mean, I'm just I'm just going to leave it there. And I'm going to turn it over to Susan. Thank you very much. Would you set my slides up? Yes, Claude. Thanks, Renee. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate that. Let's, let's give him a hand. Woo! <laughs> Thanks so much for coming out tonight. A few years ago, I walked into my office one morning, and waiting for me was an email from management telling me to put three names on a list. My company was about to go through a reduction in force, and I was asked, to name three people from my project team, my team that I was managing, who would lose their jobs that week. Now, the first two names were easy, because I already had one person that I had on a performance improvement plan. We were at the end of the plan, and I knew that it wasn't going to work out. And it was very easy for me to put that person's name on the list. Free ride there. I had a second person who had just started a performance improvement plan. I already knew that it was not going to go well, and putting their name on the list would just shortcut some of the uh, stress and uh, get us to the solution that we were going to get to anyway quicker. It was the third name that I had a problem with. Because after that, I ran a pretty lean organization. I had dealt with my problem issues when they came up according to the way that my company wanted these things dealt with. I didn't have another name to put on the list, even though I was managing a team of 100 people. So there were a lot of people there. But we had grown up together, so to speak. They were like family to me. I agonized over what to do about this with that third name. All day, I was sick. I couldn't eat. I went home that night, I couldn't sleep. It occurred to me that whoever's name I put on that list would be devastated in the same way that I would be. At that time, I was a, a single parent raising a child. My daughter depended on me for the house, the food, the clothes. I had a lot at risk. I would have hated to get that word. but. I also couldn't stand to put one of my good people on that list either. We were billing. We had client support. All night I lay awake thinking what to do. I decided that if I had to put a third name on the list, then it was going to be mine. Because I would take the hit 
that somehow I had allowed my company to get into this position where they suddenly need to let people go, that I hadn't managed things well enough to keep this terrible thing from happening. And this was a job that I loved. I had been there for years. Everything that I had depended on keeping this job. But when I thought about and imagined myself putting that third person's name on the list from my team, I could not imagine getting up the next morning and looking at myself in the mirror. I was cold with the fear, but I walked in the next day shaking to my boss's office. And even up to the point where I walked in, I had those moments of doubt. I was afraid of what might come out of my mouth <laughs> when, when it was time to say that third name. As project managers, we're paving the road that didn't exist before. It's part of our job to make decisions all the time. We make decisions every day in our projects. In some projects, you, you may be making 10, 20, 30 decisions every day. And these decisions are not without consequences. And they're not always easy. A lot of times we've got stakeholder interests that are conflicting with, you know, P&L interests or, or something else. There are consequences of these decisions. On some of my more intense projects, I would suffer from decision fatigue. You know what that is? When you go home at night and, and I couldn't even make the decision between white or wheat bread on my sandwich because I was done. I had done all the decisions I could possibly do in one day. Luckily, the Project Management Institute gives us a roadmap. They have already done some of the hard work of coming up with some ethical decision-making rules and a roadmap on how to apply those. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. My name is Susan Kennedy. I am currently the president of the PMI Dallas chapter. I'm also an independent consultant. I also happen to teach the PMP exam prep course here at UT Dallas. Yay. And in my other spare time, my husband and I own a real estate business. So I am out showing clients houses tomorrow morning when we finish with this tonight. Joining me on the stage here is Kalud. Hi everyone, my name is Clude Alsayed. It's not typically the name that would roll off your tongue. I go by Clude, which is Clue with a D at the end. It's not my medical condition, I promise you it's my name. That is what my parents <laughs> called me. I am a PMP certified PMP, been an active member of the PMI Dallas chapter and I have the honor of assisting Susan Kennedy, our president. I also am a proud member of the PMI Dallas Toastmasters Club. Any Toastmasters in the room? <laughs> Woo! Toastmasters! <laughs> I also sit on the board of the Ascend Pan-Asian Leadership Organization. It's not for profit, and it's an awesome organization. And I'd like to say thank you for coming out tonight and giving us a couple hours of your very busy Tuesday. This is a testament to the dedication you have to the profession and the industries you work in. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Kudos to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know ethics is not a hot topic. It's not typically a conversation starter. It's not like something you would want to talk about the first time you approach someone. So to help you loosen you up a little bit, we have a, a, an icebreaker. Everybody's ready? I want to sense the excitement. Ready? <laughs> awesome. So everyone, I want you to turn to the person on your left and say, you look gorgeous this evening. Come on. You look gorgeous, Clude. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Now I, I'm looking good. <laughs> I was waiting for this compliment. Thank you. Now I want you to turn to the person on your right and say, I wish I could say the same about you. Let's do it. <laughs> I'll do it. I, I wish I could say the same thing about you. I don't like John. <laughs> awesome. So this is how you get to grow your network, expand your knowledge. With that, I would like to allow John to introduce himself and tell us what his helper role is tonight. Hi, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening. My name is John Signo. I am also on the uh, PMI Toastmasters, also a fellow of uh, the PMI Dallas uh, uh, chapter. I am your pollster. Remember, this is about ethics. Please, please vote only once. <laughs> I'm watching. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. Thanks, John. Okay, ethics, not physics, 
is the topic tonight. We'll talk about what that means. In our, uh, our roadmap of what we're doing tonight, we just did the intros. We're going to talk about some breaking news relevant to ethics and headlines. We'll talk about the PMI Code of Ethics, just give you a refresher on it if you, if you haven't already read the thing. And then we're going to get right into some role plays where you, the audience, are going to vote on what should be done in particular ethical situations. Then we'll wrap it all up, summary, and do a Q&A. So what constitutes ethical? It doesn't have a definition, per se. Is it local? Is it universal? Is it having confidence, integrity, competence? Is it having the confidence to stand alone in the most conflicting situations? Is it having resilience? So what is ethics? And to me, when I think of ethics, the quote that stands out to me the most is Albert Einstein's quote, relativity applies to physics, not ethics. Now, if you ask me, I would tell you if Albert Einstein was a project manager in corporate America, who would have probably changed his quote to something like this. Relativity applies to ethics and project management. We have a scope management plan. We have resources management plan. We have, we have uh, scope management. We have all sorts of plans. Why don't we have a, an ethics management plan, since it's detrimental to the success or failure of your project? Why is that? Can anybody guess? Is it not encompassed with human resources? It is encompassed. The question. question was, is it not encompassed within human resources? Good question. That's a, that's a, that's a very good question. It's in the part of the fabric of the, of the infrastructure of the organization. To me, ethics, it, it's not black and white. It's not, it's 50 shades of gray. It is not, it's a scale. It's not like you have. It's assumed to already be there. It's assumed to exist already. Correct. And it's the culture that you want to spread throughout your organization. Now, I want you to raise your hand when you've had enough. These are some of the headlines that, <laughs> I, that popped up when I Googled. There was no shortage in the supply. I can assure you that. Yahoo, former Chief Executive Scott Thompson, he was accused of resume padding. Volkswagen, emission scandal. General Motors, ignition switch recall. Bernie Madoff, expert global solutions, a debt collection agency that was accused of using deceptive debt collection practices. LaxoSmithKline, this one is the most disturbing and unsettling. Overprescribing medication, and they were giving physicians perks for overprescribing medication for off-label uses that were not approved by the FDA. Wells Fargo, 3.5 million potentially fake accounts. And now I would like to play a little hmm. video, an interview of former Wells Fargo employees. When these scandals hit, I can just imagine the people in the companies who had some idea of what was going on, how they felt. And when I think back on my own experience, how I felt when faced with my ethical dilemma where I had so much to lose, you often hear employees say things like, I was afraid of losing my job. I knew that fear. I see how easy it would be to be quiet. Oh. To just open sales unethically. It was just what we were taught, and we just did it. More than six months after the fake account scandal damaged Wells Fargo's reputation, there's been very little accountability at the top. Attorney Michael Cade represents former Wells Fargo employees. I can understand if one district manager is putting pressure on the people below him or her. But if this is going on nationwide, you would think that there is somebody above the district manager that is putting pressure on the DM to get something done. When news of the scandal spread, CEO John Stumpf left the bank, following a fiery congressional grilling. It's gutless leadership. And so did the head of the retail bank, Carrie Tolstead. The bank is now holding back some executive compensation, but both Stumpf and Tolstead walked away with millions tied to a rising stock price boosted by aggressive sales tactics. Stumpf said the bank never told employees to commit fraud, but many former workers say the pressure led to that. We had a lot of pressure, remember, just as a teller, you know, we had the bankers 
just on our backs. And then to get the client to, to get the client point. that I had as a teller uh, standing up to get them sitting down with the banker. We would look at a phone number and maybe misconstrue one of the numbers. Oh, is your home number still at one two three four? Even though on the screen it said one two three four five. And so it was just anything to get them to our desk. In fact, she claims almost everyone at the branch, herself included, was either lying to customers or complicit in it. Another former employee explained how simple it was to open a fake account. So it's pretty much like you signing a blank paper and then the rest of the information is filled in, saying, oh, this is just to reopen you know, your savings account or reactivate your savings account. But, you know, when the customer leaves, they could put, put 10 accounts on there and then open it and the signature is there. And even if the customer calls to complain, well, Mr. Customer, your signature is there. At best, customers with unauthorized or unnecessary accounts were confused and hassled. At worst, they were hit with overdraft fees and some saw their credit scores suffer. How did you get the idea in your head that if I don't do this unethical thing, I'm going to lose my job? What made you think that? I mean, they would just tell us that, that, that it was just, it was verbalized. We just, again, always had pressure from management, upper management. They were witness to what, what we were doing. I mean, they coached us because they had to sign off on everything. Regulators found similar activity across the country. According to a new Wells Fargo investigation, runaway sales practices had been an issue since at least 2002. And John Stump admitted he was aware of the problem since 2013. I remember being uh, uh, at least making an impression upon me in, in 2013. So for six years, regular meetings with one of your most important managers, those discussions, you have no recall that that ever came up. I, I, not in, in the way I had in 2013. But the bank waited until 2016 before doing away with the aggressive sales goals. Wells Fargo says this is in the past now. Its number one priority is rebuilding trust, and the bank has made fundamental changes to reduce the pressure on workers and ensure customers are aware of new accounts opened. The bank's paid $185 million so far in fines, although it still faces more than a dozen investigations and lawsuits. But just like the financial crisis, jail time for senior executives is unlikely. Has Wells Fargo suffered enough? Have, no, absolutely the... not. As soon as I see five or six people go to jail for a very long time, federal prison, I would say that our system of government is doing something about this. Who should carry the weight of what happened? You know, there was always some, you know, obviously some guilt. You know, I'm human. Um, but it was just the stress of, of losing your job every day. I mean, the company, it was very sales driven and they didn't care how they got it, at what cost. <clears throat> Oops. Yeah, don't let it play the next one. <laughs> Cat videos. Who doesn't like cat videos? videos? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just about guarantee that that will change the way you view Wells Fargo. For me at least, I think twice before I consider banking with Wells Fargo. It's not only a reputation hit, it's not only a reputation damage, it's, it goes deeper. It's a culture that, that didn't, that's been there, sitting there for a while. We're, we're all focusing on targets. We're willing to compromise our standards to the point where we're asking our employees to commit fraud on a daily basis. Imagine being a single mom. Imagine being, your, your source of income is on the line. It's either committing fraud or not providing for your family. So these, these are the types of situations that you may not necessarily face on a daily basis, but I, I guarantee you come close to similar situations. Now, I want you, by show of hand, how many of you have witnessed or observed an ethical behavior? Raise your hand. I did. Wow, a lot of hands. Now, how many of you have been a target or on the receiving end of an unethical behavior? How many is not telling the, thru the truth? <laughs> <laughs> This is a 2016 global ethics survey that came out of ECI, which is Ethics and Compliance Initiative. And they 
the respondents, over a thousand workers, public and private sectors, it was a, mis a, a mishmash of lots of, de the demographic was very diverse. Now, can anybody guess what was the number one unethical behavior or misconduct that people observed? Sexual harassment? Close. She said uh, sexual harassment. Cheating. Cheating? Cheating? You're pretty Lying. close. <laughs> Lying. Lying. You guys are very close. So 22% said abusive or intimidating behavior towards employees. That's the equivalent of bullying. The other, the other one up there is lying to employees, customers, vendors, or the public. Can anyone guess what the next one is? Falsifying documents or time cards. Close. It's decisions made or actions to benefit the employee, self-serving. People who have only their best interests at heart, you don't care about the university, you don't care about what happens to the rest of the world. Respondents said that 22% of them are faced with pressure to compromise the standards. Of the 22%, I apologize, 30% uh, observed misconduct. Of the 30%, 76% reported the misconduct, they blew the whistle. Of the 76%, 53% said that they, were, they experienced retaliation. People came after them. Now PMI's code of ethics lays out four major values for project managers. And these are responsibility, respect, fairness, and honesty. And PMI publishes this code of ethics to make it a little bit easier eight-page code of ethics and put some detail behind it to give specific examples of what they mean by responsibility and respect and fairness and honesty to others. And I put a little chart up that, that breaks it down just a little bit further. In the code of ethics and professional conduct, these are the values, those four major values. And then each one of them has a definition, and then each one has the examples, some examples below them. PMI took a look, PMI Global Organization, in the 1980s, they took a look at what makes a profession a profession. And they came up with three things. One is professional standards. One is certifications to verify that such a profession exists. And the third thing that they decided that makes a, a profession a profession is a code of ethics that needs to be followed by its people. So in the 1980s, PMI developed this code of ethics. It was last updated in 2006. It is applicable around the world. So if you are a member of PMI, and let me see a show of hands. How many PMI members we got here? Okay, majority of the audience. That wasn't a poll question, but thanks, John, for being ready. <laughs> if you're a member of PMI, you are required to uphold the code of ethics. You sign a document saying, I will. That is the same document that you sign around the entire world, hundreds of thousands of project managers. So PMI worked hard to try to make these ethics applicable across all of the different cultures, across all of the different countries. And they came up with these. Very interesting. And anybody who is a member of PMI, and possibly even non-members, I'm not sure, because I've been a member too long, I've forgotten what it was like, can go out to PMI's website, pmi.org, and download this code of ethics. It is an awesome document when you read it. It's got some great descriptions and information about it. And in addition to this, PMI has also done a roadmap to talk about the decision-making framework when you're faced with an ethical decision to make and you're not sure uh, what takes precedence and priority, they have a, a decision-making framework that they put together, which is a second document, the decision-making framework map. And it starts with gathering the facts. It talks about take a breath, <laughs> think about it, stop and go gather the facts. When I was early in my career as a project manager, I had someone come running into my office alleging terrible behavior by another employee. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna to have to take some action for sure. 
you know, that's terrible, I said, and they spilled their heart out to me. That person exits, I call in the person who's been alleged to do something wrong, and I say, could you tell me a little bit about this situation? They tell me a completely different story, and now I'm, I'm going, oh my gosh. <laughs> what I thought was an open and shut case, I've got to go do some more research. So I learned early on, you spend the time um, to gather the facts and look for supporting documentation of things that supposedly happened or other people to corroborate one story or the next. The next thing you do is decision uh, alternatives. Consider what the choices are. And again, you get the feeling when you're reading PMI's uh, decision-making framework that, that they're really saying, slow down. <laughs> slow down. Just think about it. Consider the choices carefully and identify your candidate decision and then start testing its validity. Apply the ethical principles to that candidate decision and see if it, if it stands up and then make your decision. Whoops, sorry about that. Did you catch me? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to run through a few scenarios. These are real life scenarios and we're going to ask for your opinion before and then each one of us would argue one side of the, of the argument and then we'll see which one you vote for. Hopefully that explained it. Yeah, they'll catch on if they didn't already. Now we had earlier put up, uh, could we flip back to the slide of text uh, to join the poll so that your vote counts? Uh, you'll need to go ahead and pull out your cell phone. This is one of the presentations where we actually ask you, pull out your cell phone. <laughs> we want to see those cell phones in action. And go ahead and text to this number. John, do you have it handy? Yes, it's um, 22333. Text, I'm sorry, uh, text PMI Dallas. No, 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 it's 22333. 223, yes, 22333. It's yeah. that one. Coming and up. then the message you're going to text says... PMI, PMI Dallas. PMI Dallas, 558. 558. Let's give people just another minute. PMI Dallas, 558. And the very first question, can we flip to it? The first question that we've asked just to test your um, polling ability is one that just asks, well, who are you? It's a uh, A for first level uh, individual contributor, B for a first level manager, C for middle level, and D for executive. And if you would, just go ahead and, and vote. And are we, yeah, there we go. There you go. We have movement. We're, we're working. We're live. Oh, the race is on, folks. <laughs> I see a couple of heads down. We're going to give uh, just a, a few more seconds for people to, to go ahead and get logged in. Like I said, we really want your vote to count. So um, get in. The first time that I logged in, I misspelled PMI. <laughs> <laughs> then I text my answer and I got a response back saying, well, you know, join a poll first. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay. Right. Coming up. Looks like right. the winner so far is individual contributor. Yes, individual contributors make up 38% of our audience tonight. Then uh, the next biggest category is middle level managers, okay, with the 28% there. Up, up. No, it's, it's still the same. Individual way. contributors are coming on stronger. <laughs> and then? Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I know. What's going on with A D? is the leader. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Anybody having any problem with this? Have we got it going? Okay. Okay. Then we're going to flip back. There will be a test. <laughs> okay, scenario one. All right, here's the scenario. It involves you and a coworker and a client. So in this scenario, you and your coworker are Sarah, who is a PMP and you're a project manager. You're project business consultants for IT startups. This is what you do. And part of developing your business model is to look at competitors. Now you've got a client who has hired you to develop their business model and do a competitive landscape. Take a look at who's out there in the space and what they're doing. Now in this situation, your client is a big fat contract client. It's a, a large contract. You were thrilled to win it. 
They are expecting to launch multiple IT startups over the coming years, and you are looking forward to a long and fruitful relationship with this client. One thing that you've noticed is that uh, they are particularly keen to hear more about one particular competitor out there in this, in this space. Now, you and your coworker, Sarah, you've tried to be neutral, but your new client says he's paying you for this expertise. This is what he hired you for. This is what you're doing, and he wants to know more about a particular competitor that was your client a year ago. He has a right to as much knowledge and expertise as you have, he says. So given that scenario, without going into a whole <laughs> lot of other detail, go ahead and cast your vote now. Are you going to share information about the competitor with your client, or are you not going to share information about the competitor? So you can keep it general and unspecific, or you can give a little bit more information. Now, you have this information. In fact, you know things that would help the new startup out tremendously if you shared this information with him. So what are you doing? Looks like uh, we've got some on both sides. Please what vote now. That? Take your time. You have five seconds. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh -huh. Oh, OK. Got some people on the yes side. Well, we have eight yeah. in the yes side, okay. nine. There you go. All right. Still outnumbered by the no by uh, 18. Two to one. But yeah, two to one, <laughs> two to one so far. <clears throat> okay. Let's move on. Okay, so we've got uh, a lot of no's, not as many yeses. That was our voting results. So let's argue this a little bit. I'm going to take the, uh, I'm taking the yes. The yes side. OK, so anyway, the client's right. He's paying for your expertise and your knowledge. He has, a, he has a contract in place with you. You are required per this contract to provide this expertise and knowledge. That's what they hired you for. And you've got an obligation to provide the best service possible to this client. So you know. I, I get the service aspect of it. I get that you're trying to deliver the best service you can. But I'm going to have to say no to this. We are bound by confidentiality agreement. Ah. We cannot give out this information. Uh, something you don't know is that client last year, he was in such a rush to do a startup, he actually forgot to ask us to sign a non-disclosure about his business. So we didn't actually sign a contract. You verify that with contracts? Absolutely. It's 100%. There is no non-disclosure with the X client. I would say what's at stake right now is our reputation. And by you leaking or giving out this information, what kind of message are you telling? Are you giving this client? They will, they will think that their information might be shared with a future client at some point in the future. The reputation that's at stake here is what am I doing for my current client? I have told them that we're experts in this area. I have sold them on the fact that we know a lot about IT startups. In fact, we know IT startups in their industry. This is the information that they have paid me for and contracted with me for. That's cute. I would say no. <laughs> Do not. OK. Um, well, I'll cite some PMI code of ethics positions for you. Honesty says, I got to provide the information in an accurate information in a timely manner. They asked me to be honest. They've asked me a direct question. I need to answer it. That's a weak leg to stand on, Susan. <laughs> I would say fairness, and it says we are allowed to share information with those authorized, underline the word authorized, to have that information. But I still have to fulfill my commitments. I've got a you can commitment. fulfill your commitment by <laughs> stating that I am, I, I'm not going to share specifics about a previous client. Mm. Respect says that I need to listen to other people's point of view. And my client has a different point of view from that. He thinks it's perfectly fine for me to share this information with him. We hold proprietary information. This is, the, in essence, what we do. This is what we possess. This is our expertise. You can anonymize, share learnings, but not specifics about the previous client. And this is in the responsibility tenant. Mm -hmm. OK, well, let's what vote again. Say to that? <laughs> let's, let's see if we convinced anybody to the other side. Do another vote. Whoops, sorry. Ah. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, too fast on the trigger. Another vote. Did anybody change their mind based on? Yes, sir. I did change my mind because I didn't really understand the question, ah. the, the, the boundaries of the question. And I felt, <coughs> I felt like generalities and general experience should be able to be shared with the, with the follow on client. But, uh, specific but, but the specifics, yeah. you wouldn't, it wouldn't be right to do so. Okay, so this gentleman said that when we were talking earlier, the, the question was maybe a little bit general. We were saying whether we would share general information or specific information about one particular client. And when you think of it that way, does that change the vote? Look at this. This is interesting. Sounds like I'm winning. <laughs> Somebody needs to keep score. <laughs> yeah, Kalud wants to win all of these, but I, we're not going to let her. <laughs> totally. Okay. So, yeah, a little bit more than two to one. A little bit more. Okay. Going. Going. I, I, I didn't change my mind. I, I'm in the yes category. Hmm. You're going to share the specific information about another no. client. I think that in in the situation. Look, way, you convince somebody. Well, <laughs> the, the thing is, is that all companies have publicly available information, and if you're under contract with a new person, you can certainly share any publicly available information on that company. There's no, there's no, there's nothing that says you can't share information. And then when you get to a point where you're saying, "Oh, you want to know private secrets about that company." Well, obviously, you can't share that. <laughs> so that's why I stayed in the yes. OK. OK, let's move on. Click it. All right, so for this particular ethical dilemma, it was this customer is wanting specific information about their competitor. Do you share that specific information or not? We give it to Clude. <laughs> she says no. <laughs> Fairness and responsibility require that you maintain information about prior clients. You maintain confidentiality about prior clients. In other words, like Renee said, you share. You can give them public information. They can rock and roll. It's available on the website. But when it comes to specifics that they shared under the contract, you cannot give that out. Thank you, no idea. It doesn't matter. Your reputation is at risk. But NDA, it's, it's enforceable that way. That's right. With or without it, the code of ethics bounds you to keep confidential information confidential. As Renee said, publicly uh, available information, that's different. If it's out there for anybody to see or find, that's, that's different. But this is specific information that you got because you helped that company in their startup last year, and you know their secrets. So we're saying but challenges. No to that. Can you? I'm sorry. <laughs> so that uh, new customer should realize if you share your prior customer's information with him, you're going to turn around and share his information with the next one. Of course. So exactly. So the new customers it's information the platinum will rule. be protected <laughs> under that rule. Exactly. Okay, so this was kind of our warm-up uh, polling to make sure that people could use it and to kind of get you in the mode. Let's take the next scenario. Number two, and this one is sabotage. <laughs> okay, you're the project manager for a newly installed IT system. Apologies to uh, Vince and any others who represent the construction arm of project management. <laughs> Wish I'd thought of a construction one for us, but we'll just continue with this for now. You've just discovered that this newly installed system is being sabotaged. Data is being lost from time to time. Yikes. You don't know anything else yet. All you know is data is being lost. There is a strong likelihood you believe it probably is sabotaged. Somebody has hacked into your brand shiny new system. So you don't know yet the extent of the problem or who is involved or how long it's been going on. You just know it, it, it's there. So vote right now. When are you going to tell your client? Are you going to tell them right now? You just found out it's hot off the press? Or are you going to wait until you've gathered more information? <laughs> uh, yeah. We'll take that under advisement. <laughs> Got a ringer here who's. <laughs> Make sure you sell your stock first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so we've got a pretty good split there between now. Oh, oh, oh now, no, now, 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 now's winning. Now's winning, or when you have more info. Okay. Oh, oh, whoa, got a good. Yeah, the Equifax is a bit of a ringer there, isn't yes. it? <laughs> it? Just hit the news. Fresh wounds. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so we got a twenty to thirteen between now and later. So I'm going to take the now. I'm going to say, sorry, Susan, it's going to be later. <laughs> <laughs> well, when would you want to know if it was your data being sabotaged? What are you going to say to that? They're going to hammer you with questions. Are you going to make up information? We don't know how material the issue is. We don't know the extent of the bug or the issue. We don't even know if it's a verified bug. Huh. Well, there's pretty strong evidence that it's sabotage. And this information is not like a fine wine. It, it's more like fish. It's not going to get any better. It's just going to get stinkier with age. This IT solution that we just rolled out, it's a shared environment. We, it's shared between this client and 50 other clients. If you give out this one bit of information to that one client, not only that you're compromising the confidentiality agreement we have with others, but you're also letting them know that there is a vulnerability. Kalud, that makes it even worse because there are other clients potentially impacted by this. I mean, how are you going to answer the client when they come to you and say, oh, well, how long have you known? When did you find this out? We can tell them we found out it was a material issue a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Not six months ago, a couple of weeks ago. You know, Clude, you yourself, just a month ago, had a quote to me when you and I were dealing with an issue. Do you remember what you said to me? I say a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is true. <laughs> I show up and talk. <laughs> Don't record. Your words, rip the Band-Aid off. <laughs> that was a different context. That was a different context. You're, but the principle still applies. <laughs> the job rip is the on the line. Off. You're causing undue concerns and alarm on the client side, and we don't have enough information. Rip the Band-Aid off. OK. <laughs> Honesty says we provide accurate information in a timely manner. Timely being a key word here, in my opinion. I'm going to use the responsibility tenant where it says we protect proprietary or confidential information that has been entrusted to us. Oh, I don't see how that applies here because. You're, showing, you're letting them know there is a back door in our system. And they know that this is not their dedicated system, it's shared with other clients. Mm. It's not going to get better <laughs> when you wait. Fairness says equal access to that information to those who are authorized to have it. If, if anybody's authorized to have this information, it's going to be my client. They're authorized for it. Well, I'm going to stand by the responsibility, Tenant. Yeah. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to quote responsibility and say, when we discover, this is straight out of PMI's code of ethics, when we discover errors, we communicate them to the appropriate body, what are those last words? As soon as they are discovered. That's a little subjective. <laughs> I would say as soon as it's confirmed. Mm, that's not what it says. <laughs> okay, let's take another poll. When should you tell your client? You're going to go with me and tell them right now? Going to run down to their office and tell them? Or you're going to go with Clued and wait and gather more info? I would say if you're going to hold your position, update your resume and tell the client. <laughs> <laughs> Has to be in that order. <laughs> My job's been at stake before. <laughs> And in fact, it probably is with us. Some people too. later, later. Oh. <laughs> no, don't do it. Don't listen to her. She's leading you astray. <laughs> the now has increased. Uh -huh. I want some people over yeah. to my side. Okay, from the audience, any comments about this before we uh, give you the uh, the standard? Yes, Wayne. Uh, get a microphone over to Wayne. Let's hear what you think. I mean, it's like with uh, actually kind of a construction one where we had to handle an environmental abatement. It was more important for us to communicate that out so that everybody was in the know, to know even though we didn't know all the information. And you, we were, but along with it, we also outlined what we were doing to try and get the details. So we weren't just going, going, eh. We were like, hey, we don't know everything that's going on, but we are in the process of doing the analysis. We've got the basics. Here's the basic information. We don't know the full extent. And by doing that, it, it gave trust in us 
and and our and also build confidence in making a partnership with all the other agencies that we had to work with. Okay, very good. So you were actually in the position where something's been discovered, and I'm not going to hold on to that info. All right. Renee, anybody? Would you like to take the other side, Renee? <laughs> okay, sure. I stay. I stay to be. Yeah. Here's I, another. I, well, here, Dieter, you go. <laughs> There's one one factor uh, that I wanted to comment on. By coming out now, chart, it has the advantage that if I go to the customer and tell him. We got a problem, we, I found the problem. I don't have all the details. The first thing that you have taken away is the effect of a surprise, which no customer likes. And the second thing that is my own experience, because I've been in these situations, is that I, as I got more and more information, I would share it with him. Here's the next step, here's what we're looking for. And at one point, I would turn over and said, how about you actually helping us? Can you help us with this so that we, you know, four I see more than two? And I brought them in to help to find a solution. And that cooperation has worked every time. The key one was no surprise. And I have heard that afterwards many times. Surprises can be good. That's why you have to use it later. <laughs> I've gotten good surprises, birthdays. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm with the no surprise, especially not your client, okay? They, they don't like them. All right, so let's take a look at uh, what we think. Now, in these scenarios that we set up, obviously we haven't given you all the information that might be relevant or that you might want to know, but what we're giving you here with the, with, with the which one is the better answer is a starting position answer. This is where you should start from when you're looking at what to do in these kinds of situations. Now you can consider other factors that may not be on the table here, but in general, honesty, fairness, and responsibility, all three of these require that you let the client know right away. And uh, the, the Susan Kennedy slant says, within five minutes, ideally. Don't let this thing age. It's not going to get any better. The client's not going to be happy with it and it's gonna look really bad for you. So ethically, there is supporting uh, documents for go, go now. Share it as if it were your own information. Fine, Susan, be that way. <laughs> <laughs> and as a matter of fact, as the gentleman in the audience said, when we were putting together these slides a couple of months ago, Equifax wasn't in the news yet, but I couldn't help but go out and grab the uh, 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 little bit of information on it because this is exactly what they did. It was like six weeks before they let us know. How many in the audience know that you were affected by that Equifax scandal? Leak, hacking. Yeah, me. Yeah, me personally. <laughs> yes, sir? No, or believe. Yeah, well, okay. Were they, they gave you a website to go out and check your social security number and your name and information, and they come back to you and let you know whether your records were compromised in the hacking. So I checked and yeah, I'm on the dang list. <laughs> Nobody's happy about this. The public understands hacking, like we get it. We know it happens and we know even the, the top levels of government can't always protect against hacking. What we don't understand is six weeks we feel like that gave the bad guys a six-week head start on, on whatever it is that they're doing with that information. It's the later thing that's the problem. We have a question up here in the audience, or a comment. <laughs> the Equifax Do we have any Equifax employees in the room? Sorry. Um, They'll put them on. Uh, I was just going to say, I guess the assumption is it's a, it's a bona fide problem. Right? Yes. You don't react in five minutes if you think it's fake or if it's not really clear that it's an issue, right? The assumption has to be that it is a bona fide problem, but it might not be. If it's not, does that change your vote? Do you tip the customer off or not? In other words, does it make a difference in what you're going to do? 
if you're not 100% sure. Remember, this is early stage. You just found out. But those words, sabotage, <laughs> hacking, loss of data, those are pretty strong and powerful words. It depends on what data is at stake. If it's payment information, if it's your social security number, if it's your health records, then it's likely going to be a bona fide issue as opposed to it being a, just a, a, an issue that you thought was not confirmed incident, so to speak. And this is another place where your management and communication skills come to play. Because how you deliver that message, running in with the fire drill you know, sounding and, and uh, bells ringing may not be appropriate but certainly coming in very quickly and saying, I've just been notified of this. I've just been notified that we are losing data. We don't know yet X, Y, we don't know who, how, when, where. We don't know those things yet. I wanted to give you the heads up the minute that I heard about it. We're now gonna go back and investigate and see what it is. It's not the F, it's the when. You were, if you're sitting on incredibly valuable asset or information, it eventually is going to get compromised. It's how you respond to it and how you communicate and how you handle the situation is what makes the difference. And I will say, even on information that's not necessarily at that level, it's still important to your client. They just paid you to implement a system to do something with it. I think you had better tell them, even if it's library books, I don't care what it is, your client's going to want to know when you know. You won me over, Susan. Okay. <laughs> I'm a Come convert. Come on to the dark side. Do you have a uh, question? Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, so I was just saying that uh, if it's not a real problem, which you discover later, I think it works out to your advantage because you've conveyed to the client that you communicate as soon as you find out. And then, uh, so that builds your reputation. And then it was not a real error. So it's not a big deal anyway. So it, it works in your favor, actually, if it's not a real problem. But you communicate when you find out. That's correct. It generally works in your favor, I will say. Not 100%. Because as I said earlier, with all of these ethical situations, thank you for that good comment. With all these ethical situations, you may still suffer consequences of doing the right thing. Your customer may be so antsy that they say, you know what, we're out of here. We don't want to continue with you anymore. That, that can happen. You hope for the better outcome. You hope that they have the same kind of integrity that you would have and that they will recognize your honesty and upfrontness. Doesn't 100% happen all the time. You are still running a risk no matter what you do. What you have to do is be centered, be sure of yourself, when you know that you're doing the right thing, then you're ready to suffer those consequences if they come. And that's the difference. Okay. Next up, this is this one I'm sure will hit close to home for everyone. It's performance evaluation time. You get into you get called into a meeting with your boss, Sam, the big boss, and he tells you, you know what? You're assigned you cannot give anyone fours or fives. Five, they have to walk on water. They have to do miracles. Fours and fives are out of the question. You have to give your direct reports a rating from one to three. Three, that means thank you for coming to work every day. Thank you for doing your job. One, you're on the, on the brink of getting fired. You now have an, a, a, I'm sorry, you have a high performer on your team. This person is a superstar. They're always the first one in the office. They get the job done. They're very independent. You have the, you trust them. And now you have to give this high performer a three ranking. Question is, would you assign your high performer a lower rating? Voting's open now. A for yes, B for no. Oh, here we go. Oh, oh. Yes, no. Yes, Almost. No. Almost a tie. Oh. Oh, we're at a tie. Oh, no. When Kalud and I were coming up with these ethical <laughs> scenarios, we, we were looking for things that most, a lot of people could probably relate to. How many in this audience have ever been in this situation? Ye uh, okay. Is your boss in the room? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like you were in the room. <laughs> the thing you laid out was spot on. <laughs> it, it, the exact same thing happened. Exact. 
Yep. Uh -huh. Looks like the votes are in, and it's 24. Oh, no. To the no. Okay. To the no. This is interesting, but we do have some yeses over there. So we're going to lower that rating, give them that three that boss tells us is the max that they can get. Okay. All right. Would you like to start this one, Clude? Yes. Meeting expectations is not enough. We have to send a message out to everyone in the company to bring their A game on. Uh, Sorry, eh. Susan, you can't give them five. This person is bringing their A game on. What did I just say? They have been consistently meeting the targets over and over again. Every day, they're there, they're doing it. Meeting targets, that's not enough. Thank you for coming to work every day. Hello, that's what they're paid to do. You're going to They'd do have to be them. exceptional. Oh, They'd yeah. have to, whatever work they've done, it's not only meeting their targets, exceeding their targets, and affecting our bottom line. That's how, that's how awesome they have to be. My top person's going to quit. It's demoralizing when they get a lower ranking than Listen, what they deserve. do it over lunch. Take them over to have lunch and have two glasses of wine in. Conversation <laughs> becomes more real. Make sure you don't do it at a shooting range. That's... It's simple. You just say, hey, listen, thank you for meeting expectations. I don't think the PMI code of ethics says anything about liquoring up the other person in order to get well, what you want. Maybe have some soda, okay? Like I said, don't do it in a shooting range because that might be an HR issue. Hmm. Well, this person, they've been a key team player and they've got awesome potential. I could see this person leading. I could look at my paycheck and say I have awesome potential, but it's not going to get any bigger, Susan. <laughs> they have, nobody got fours or fives in this company. So what? It's a bold new world. Let's brave some ground here. <laughs> no, Susan, no. <laughs> Let's go for it. Hmm. I'm going to cite some some of the tenants of the Code of Ethics, the PMI Code of Ethics. Yeah. We'll let you, we'll let you start. Okay, well, honesty says, I've got to be truthful. And if I'm honest, this person deserves that five. That's it. I'm honest, they deserve the five. Sorry, Susan. I'm going to quote responsibility, which basically says, we make decisions and take actions based on the best interests of society, public safety, and the environment, a.k.a. the company that you work for. Now, I don't see that that applies You want to take this company to the next level. <laughs> Meeting targets, not enough. Uh, no, I don't, I don't see that. I don't see that that applies because we need to be constantly being fair and re-examine what is the fair thing to do for this person. If we're impartial and objective, then we take corrective action as needed. And in this case, being fair and impartial and objective, I believe this person deserves the five. I'm going to stick to responsibility. I care too much about this company. I didn't get a four or five, and I was basically taking on two jobs. <laughs> yeah, but you got history. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody has baggage, okay? Let's not go there right now. <laughs> okay, but I'll quote responsibility and say that we uphold this code of ethics and we hold each other accountable to it. I'm holding you accountable to this. This is a code of ethics that says fairness, honesty. Responsibility says do the right thing. Basically. Give me some stats. Show me what this person did. What's their wow factor? Hmm. Impress me. So far, you haven't done that. You're just telling me how awesome. It's subjective. To me, it's subjective. I need it to be objective. I need to trust that when you think this person is awesome, they're awesome according to our finance department. You had me at Wells Fargo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's vote again and see if anybody changed their mind. Give us the no or the yes. So the no is I'm not changing uh, his performance rating. I'm going in for the five. The yes says, yep, I'm going to cut him down to a three. Oh, quick. <laughs> I love it when the first two come in and they're opposites. <laughs> it looks like oh, evenly matched. Come on, people. Let's <laughs> all work together. We're one team. <laughs> Wow. Okay. It looks the same. Coming down, coming down. Oh, oh, oh. Kalud, you're not doing very well over there. <laughs> All right. I won the first two scenarios. So I'm going to let you slide on this one. Somebody <laughs> Fine, have, Susan. Yeah, somebody feel sorry for Kalud and go ahead and give her a. <laughs> yes. Okay. Votes are in. I think we moved going, some people going, over to, going. The, yeah. to the no side. 
25 no and five okay yes. Okay, I have to weigh in on this because this is a battlefield I died on. Uh, we, we, we had managers that were giving everybody high evaluations, so in typical government fashion, we decided that forced ranking is the way to go, and we're going to do it on a bell curve, which means you've got winners and you've got losers. Uh, and that came down to my management telling me what I could give my employees. And I, I went, oh, bridge too far, I'm not doing this. So uh, I... You know, I saw my evaluations as me documenting what my people have done, not me giving them anything. So I ranked them accordingly, printed out their documentation from our online system, had them sign it, and then notified my boss and HR what I had done and told them that I thought we had a conflict of interest between falsifying employee records versus, <laughs> uh, you know, playing this forced ranking game. Well, I was, uh, uh, despite my best efforts to get myself fired, they did not fire me. What they did was reward me in chairing a committee of four people for a year to come up with better ways than forced ranking. Mm. And at the end of our presentation, which I, I should have got a master's thesis for, uh, <laughs> we were simply told, we disagree with you. We're going to keep doing things the same way that we've always done it. Now, punchline, I just found out about our raises for our people for this last, fisc or, or this last fiscal year, and they decided to give everybody a across-the-board same percentage raise. And the reason they told us they had to keep forced ranking was because it was an equitable way to determine raises. So uh, <laughs> this falls under the, the category of no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. But it really is important to take a stand. Uh, and, and you mentioned consequences. It doesn't matter. You still have to live with yourself. You still have to sleep at night. And I told them basically if I have to do this again, I will. So. It does sound a little bit like you were punished for an entire year for speaking up, <laughs> heading a committee for a whole year on coming up with a better way. I think it's called chasing your tail. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit of chasing your tail, sounds like. And it sounds like it was a great way to keep you distracted so that they could continue on with what they wanted to do. All Can right, wait? well, we actually, it was same company, myself and a peer manager. Um, I took the road of and documented heavily to justify and get the person the rating and went through the extra steps to get that and everybody else got the ratings that they got. Um, the other person, and I actually respect them for what they did, they brought their whole team and said, this is what the company's doing and all of y'all have done well, everybody's gonna get the same rating, but understand how I see you. And so I saw that as an integrity way of approaching it as well because where I had for the lack of a better term, the luxury of people I was able to rank low, legitimately, and well-documented. Uh, it worked out as an average for my team, so I was able to use that to my advantage. They, on the other hand, had all good performers, and so they took the integrity of bringing their team in and saying, this is what the company is doing. I don't agree with it. This is what you're going to get, but understand how I see you. And she was very well-respected for that, and, and they appreciated that approach just as well. So there's, there's a ways of working the yes and no. And the integrity comes, to me, it was important. We both, I saw it as us fighting for our team. And there are things about a company, yes, you want to be loyal to a company, you want to do what you can to help the company be successful, but at the same time, that company doesn't exist be, without that team that helps you succeed for, for, as a team. Very good. Good creative I'll, solutions. I'll we have another comment down here. Right there. Yeah. This is a situation that it, we saw. A lot of people can relate to. A lot of us have been in this position. Fresh wounds, of for sure. Fighting for. What's that? Yeah, struck a nerve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, this one really strikes a nerve. Um, I took my, uh, my PMP exam like over a decade ago, and a question very similar to this was on there. And it was, um, your, your boss asked you to do something and um, you know that it's wrong, that it's not going to work. Uh, what do you do? Um, well, I missed that question. I said I was going to do <laughs> yeah, it, the, the, answer. the answer was, you do what your boss tells you to do. That was the answer. So if it's in that context, you know, that if, if it's your boss tells you to do something, I'm just giving you pointers for the exam, <laughs> not, 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 not the <laughs> ethics. But anyways, so if it's in that context of, you know, these are the rules. If you don't like the rules, then you should quit that company or do something else. But that was the system that was in play. You know, so I'm just bringing that up there that there is a, a context 
that, that you're in. And if you don't like the context, then you address the context. Okay, good point. So context does make a difference. Yes. Perhaps if, uh, if everybody understands this, this isn't a last minute rule change. We all hired in under this. We all knew what the rule was gonna be when we came to this point. If they were that upfront with you. Yes, ma'am. So to piggyback on what this gentleman just said, I work for Mr. Cooper. Um, as some of you may know, Nation Star Mortgage was renamed Mr. Cooper for the sole, well, for the public sole purpose <laughs> of rebranding ourselves to be that company that defied having to choose between right and wrong. So there was an entire cultural rebranding, millions of dollars were spent for the purpose of not being a mortgage company, but being your neighbor, your neighbor that does the right thing, that says the right thing, and who's ethically moral and sound. So besides Equifax and Wells Fargo, um, I actually worked for Bear Stearns EMC, a subsidiary of Bear Stearns. So <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> having seen night and day, I can say that I appreciate my company actually taking a public stance and definitely an internal, as many barbecues and bouncy houses <laughs> and concerts as are we have. Are they hiring? <laughs> yeah, we are hiring, actually. Um, I even have a new pair of headphones when I want to block out the noise because I'm getting old now and I don't like noise. But um, so to that point, um, a lot of companies are taking a cultural revamp and that uh, new culturalization to not put you in a position to make an ethical decision. So either you can take it to court and you'll win or you won't go to hell. And uh, that's what we've done and I've seen a lot of companies um, here in, in recent months and in years do the same thing. Very good, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Whatever you do, don't ever give your high performer a low rating. That's gonna sit in their gut, it's gonna, it's gonna be toxic, they're, they're no longer connected or they don't care about the company. They're gonna be the working dead. They're gonna show up to work, go through the motions, and these are typically the ones that would end up sabotaging the company. They really don't care. They're, they're, not, they're gonna do more damage than good. Do we have time for one more? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And actually, um, I want to piggyback um, um, to this, uh, um, yeah, uh, to her comment in you know, rebranding. And I think the recent trend is a lot of these Fortune companies are actually going away from the annual performance review. And a, a trend is um, a gap with Delwitt and Tush. So, and I used to work for McKesson, Fortune 5. Um, they are in a, in a piloting, um, and I left a couple of years back. Um, it did not set well. You know, a lot of uh, in internally, um, you know, high performer getting low uh, evaluation. Uh, I have seen people walked out through the door. Low performer favor getting favored. You know, getting high. You know, review because that performance evaluation is also dependent on your bonus. So people are not getting, you know, happy camper. So, uh, you know, ethics question, performance evaluation, but I think companies are catching up, but they are, it's not getting in the mainstream. It needs to get catch up to the mainstream fast enough because uh, it's not only ethical question, it's also a uh, question about making your people happy because if your workforce is happy, if somebody's walking in, uh, happy, you know, they are getting uh, their work done. If I'm thinking that a company is taking care of me, they're evaluating me because I'm spending my time, um, you know, away from my family and this is my work family uh, and the, the company will take care of me um, at end of the year and they're giving me a fair performance evaluation, uh, my devotion to the company will be more rather than I know that I'll be gauged same with all other performer. So I think the trend needs to catch up with the other uh, companies, and I think it's catching up, uh, but I think what we have in place is, does not do the justification. Thank, thank you, Mona, for that. And I'm always amused a little bit to see the, the, the ways that companies will try to change things up to try to stop human behavior, <laughs> or to stop us from being the way that people are, are going to tend to be. I worked for a company once that one year, I'd worked for them several years, one year they came out and said, we are no longer going to tie your bonus or your compensation to your performance. So we're just gonna do a performance review and talk about things you can do to improve and how to get better and that kind of thing. And that's gonna have nothing whatsoever to do with your raise or your bonus. Went over like a lead balloon, nobody believed them because 
ultimately, logically, well, what else would the bonus be based on then? If it doesn't have anything to do with my performance, then any idiot can walk in here, get themselves a job, and get the same compensation, the same performance. That doesn't play very well with, especially Texans, we're really big on this kind of stuff. So not necessarily works, but companies continue to try to get better at this. Because this is a common problem. Look how many people in the audience have already had this and withstood it. And yay for companies trying to get better at it. We had another question up here? Yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you. And I, I applaud companies that are doing it. I just think we need to realize that there's a lot of companies that are going to have their rules regardless of whether we agree with them or not. Yeah. And I, I think what the gentleman said earlier, you have your own personal integrity. Maybe you want them to be a five. Well, if the company says you can't do that, or if you get in a room with 20 other managers and the person is ranked a one, you really can't do anything about that. So you've got to be able to grapple with that, and you've got to be able to communicate to the employee, regardless of how you feel, uh, you have to communicate the realities. Steakhouse. You do it over the steakhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the alcohol idea. I don't think that's going to work. <laughs> the way that we set this particular scenario up, if you noticed, I actually did not have any good strong arguments about exactly why this person was a superior performer. I was just jumping up and down saying it, but I wasn't backing it up with anything. And that's kind of what we went with when we came to the... Um, to, to some of the debates back and forth on whether you, know, you do this or not. In this particular case, we're, we're assuming that not changing it is the way to go because although I didn't provide much information, the idea is that that information did exist. So honesty, fairness, responsibility says measure them objectively. Again, we're not setting up every possible nuance in this situation. There may be cases where it's legitimate. That's but why I, they have calibration meetings where all the managers get together. They look at the same person, make sure you're not being subjective in your ranking. They have a little tough. <laughs> you could go either way on this one. Okay, scenario four. Scenario, Sam the slacker. You and Sam work for the same boss. <laughs> Sam, whenever her plate gets full, she takes time off. You know it. Right when her projects go off the rails, She's about to go on vacation. You could wait for it, you count on it, and guess what? All the work, all the projects, you inherit those, and your manager is expecting you to get them back in shape and manage your projects in addition to the ones that you inherited. Hmm. Should you report this to management or talk to Sam privately? That's the question. <laughs> Vote A, to report it to management, and B, to talk to Sam. Okay, A is to management, B is talk privately talk to, to the offender. <laughs> <laughs> there's no C. There's no all of the above, I'm sorry. <laughs> you had two choices. Ooh, it's, it's been tied. It's two choices, 20 seconds. <laughs> Pick the A or the B. Talk to Sam is taking the lead. Take it to management, lead. take it to Sam. Talk to Sam is taking the lead. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, yes. well, you're a co-worker on the same level as Sam. That's why they keep Ooh. dumping her projects over on you. Almost 50-50. Almost 50-50. Oh, look at this. This oh, one's good. We are split. at 50-50. Oh. <laughs> Somebody break the tie. There you go. <laughs> Fist fights are going to break out. Well, it looks, oh, looks like uh, A reported to management. Uh, the, Just the barely board. got that edge there. OK. OK. Everybody got their votes in? us back. Okay, I'm going to say take it to management. This is a consistent trend with Sam and you know she takes the long lunches and I hear her on those personal phone calls at her desk and the list of violations just goes on and on. Susan, is it outlawed to take vacation? Maybe she's burned out. <laughs> I didn't realize it was against the company's policy to be on vacation. Sorry. Am I going to rearrange my life around the projects? Maybe I'm getting burned out. <laughs> if I Maybe don't you should report consider this. taking vacation. You should yeah. try sometimes. Actually, the next time one of Sam's projects starts heading my way. <laughs> <laughs> did but you voice your concerns to your boss? Did you, what did you do before you arrived to that conclusion? 
just sit there and I have been stare stewing at Sam about while this she's making phone time. calls? I, I'm stewing about it. If I don't report this, we're setting a bad precedent. There should be some consequences to this kind of behavior. Maybe she's burned out. Maybe she's got a lot going on. So she's juggling too many projects. Have you considered asking for help with these additional projects that you took on? Me asking for help? It's her projects. They're now your responsibility. <laughs> yeah, and when I get them, they're behind schedule, and they're taking up more of my time than my own projects ever would. You need would. some coaching in your project management skills. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> you managed like four projects? <laughs> I've got a full plate already. We're not talking about me anyway. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Responsibility says unethical or illegal conduct has to be reported to appropriate management. Well, I'm going to cite responsibility, which basically says we only file ethics complaints when they're substantiated by facts. I'm sorry, I didn't hear any facts in your argument, Susan. You should she saw, heard, <laughs> it's, he, it's, no, you saw, heard things, that doesn't constitute a, an evidence. It is a fact that I inherit a lot of Sam's projects. There's a fact for you. What do you say? We can loan you some help. I will also, <laughs> re, I will cite respect, which says we approach directly those persons with whom we have a conflict or disagreement. I'm not talking to Sam. Sam's just going to tell me that, that, whatever she's going to say. I'm not talking to her. Susan, fairness says we constantly re-examine our impartiality and objectivity, taking corrective actions as appropriate. You have to continue to reevaluate the situation. Just talk to Sam. No, I'm not talk talking to, to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's going to hate me. Sam's going to give me all kinds of trouble. And I'm just going to end up with Sam's projects all over again. And Sam will deny it. Maybe you should take some time off. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're right. <laughs> I'll reconsider. <laughs> Ended. So, what are we going to say now? Did we convince you? <laughs> it's one to one. <laughs> go to management, go to Sam. <laughs> Find another job was option C. <laughs> well, let's remember, management won only by two last time. Mm -hmm. And, oh. okay, oh, it's a bigger lead this time. Look, Clude. <laughs> You gotta get some better arguments, Clude. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, oh. <laughs> I love it as the votes are coming in. You think it's one way and it goes the other. <laughs> this is like watching the, uh, the okay. election results. <laughs> That's about it right there. 34 going, points. Going, going? Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. What do we say? Sorry, Susan, you're going to have to talk to Sam. Fairness, respect, and responsibility require that you gather the facts by speaking with the other party. Ooh. Find out if she needs help. Maybe she can find somebody else to share this, to give the projects to. Find out why. Let her know that you're, you can't manage your work in addition to hers. Hmm. OK, let's hear from the audience. Any, uh, any other opinions or anybody have this happen to them? They had the slacker engaging. Slacker mode. You know, your coworkers are with you, and you're like, no, I don't, I don't want to say. <laughs> okay, Kurt. Kurt here. Give us, uh, give us your thoughts on this one. Set up the context. Were you the slacker or the other person? Kurt. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I've been both. Uh, I, I think the the issue is how do you report it to management? Is the is the problem that that Sam is doing something wrong, or is the problem that you were just being overwhelmed, and there's no process in place to, to address it. So, so when you go to management, it, it all depends on how you report it and what kind of, what kind of problem it really is. All right. So there's, there's the option for talking to management in a respectful way, perhaps even seeking guidance from management. Uh, it's going to be hard for management not to see below the veneer if I'm this angry. I've had it up to here. You know, that I'm not actually seeking, I'm trying to report it. <laughs> but there are situations, the nuances are going to happen, where sometimes that is better is to go seek some right, advice. Right, but, you know, it's the old saying by Deming back in the 50s, you know, you don't, you don't look at the problem with the people, you look at the system. The and if, if the problem is, it sounds to me like there's some system problem here, which you could certainly 
uh, take up with management. That's considered a fact. That's what you gather. Do we have a process for a handoff? Do we have a process for making sure that whatever I am getting from Sam is in, in it? We have, a, we have rules of engagement in place to where I am not far behind and my projects are not suffering in return. So that's one of the facts you would want to gather. And you say it's nothing against Sam, it's primarily that we don't have the framework in place to guarantee that whatever project I, or whatever assignments I get from other people, they're not going to affect my productivity. Okay. Any other comments? Thoughts? Emotional outbursts? Repressed memories? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so these are our takeaways. We want you to walk away with this. <laughs> I was not here. I did not even get up this morning. <laughs> I see nothing. I was not here. I did not even get up this morning. <laughs> Khalid's so funny. When Khalid and I were talking about doing this presentation and we were saying, okay, we're going to set up some ethical dilemmas, some scenarios and talk about this and that, she told me, I keep hearing Sergeant Schultz's voice in the back of my head. I see nothing, I hear nothing, and I did not even get up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is not, on a serious note, that's not the takeaway from <laughs> <laughs> That's not actually. I hope nobody took us seriously on that one. PMI is pretty square about uh, when they say that pretty much anything is uh, it, it, on the PMP exam, just about any question that asks whose responsibility is it to do anything, it's almost always the project managers. They put it squarely on your shoulders. So to wrap this up, ethics do matter. They can make a huge difference in your company's ability to continue to survive and thrive, not just in your own personal situation. There's a code of ethics out there to help guide you. Go look it up. It's, it's a great document. Some, some awesome thought leaders have put a lot of time into that code of ethics. And they also put together that decision-making framework that says gather the facts first before you go off half-cocked. Consider the choices. Identify the decision. Apply the ethical principles. Also reach out to others. And for me, it's understanding the organizational personal values, writing down what you really stand for, what your brand is, what you want to send out to everybody else in the world. For me, it was integrity and, and competency, as well as trust. As soon as you write those down, you, you have your moral compass in place, so to speak. Understand your organizational co culture, what the company wants you to do. You carry their brand wherever you go. Gathering all the facts. That is very critical. That is very key. And sometimes the, you, you would think you have a fact, but it's not a fact. You have to have somebody else question that fact and you, the way you went about gathering this. Which brings me to the next point. Take a step back and identify ethical issues at play. Is it an HR issue? Is it, what is it? Are we violating a standard, a law? What is at stake? Sometimes I personally cannot be, I can't really isolate the problem from and, and tied back to its core issue. I can't, I, I fail to do that. Sometimes I rely on outsiders, folks who can, who are not invested, they're not so close to the scene that could give me a perspective. It helps to have lawyers, if you have friends who are lawyers, don't have <laughs> physicians, because if you have a physician, everything is a binary event. Did anybody die? The answer is no, then I don't hear where the problem is. That's their position. Ensure legality, company policy, ethics, uh, anti, Every company, they have their own program, mandatory training that you have to take. Make sure you write down some of the key values that the company stands for. If any of those come close to being violated, make sure you know what the process is for reporting these. Don't be afraid. Blow the whistle. Start by sharing your good intentions. Sometimes if it's one of those difficult conversations, start by saying, we both care about the same thing. Sometimes, yes, you can work your way back. But start by sharing your good intentions. I'm not trying to make you look bad. I'm not trying to ambush you or anything. I just have a genuine concern. Think consequences. Who, what's at stake? Will people, if we fail to deliver on this, will somebody die? Would it cause somebody's information to be breached, compromised? That really, that should be in the back of your mind. Take it up a level. Don't ever, don't feel that raising your hand and asking for help means you failed to resolve the problem. It's just you want as many eyeballs on the problem as you can because you really want to make sure you're making the right decision. And that, that is very key. 
That's not my picture <laughs> when I was in fifth grade, I promise. Same okay. glasses, but not me. <laughs> now we have a hard stop at eight o'clock. Uh, so we really thank you for your participation and your attention through all of this. And um, we can take a couple more questions or comments. This is a, a subject that's been near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. And we are happy to. Uh, Any ethical or unethical decisions? Yeah, give us a little. <laughs> what happens in this podium stays in the <laughs> auditorium. Anybody have a comment? Question? Over here? Yeah, right here. Yes, I got a mic. So white collar criminals rarely get punished. So, uh, you know, why shouldn't people go and do the kind of stuff that goes on to Wells Fargo? And I'm, this is a facetious question, by the way, but you know, there's, there's a book that was recently written. There's a famous quote from James Comey called, the book is called The Chicken Shit Club. I would recommend everyone <laughs> read it. <laughs> and it's, it's exactly that, that uh, nobody gets punished for white collar crime. Nobody got punished for all the issues that happened in 2007 through, through 2009. Nobody went to jail. A lot of ethical violations happened. So why shouldn't people do it? <laughs> okay, so the question's been posed. If there are no consequences legally, then why should you care about ethics? And I'll, I'll give you my take on that. You are a leader. To me, that kind of says it all. People will not follow you if they don't trust you, if they don't trust your ethics. Conversely, if they see your standard of behavior as being the highest, then you can get so much more out of your team, out of your people, out of your life. It makes a huge difference. In my particular situation, the scenario that I set up at the very beginning where I was put on the line and told to come up with that third name, when I went into my boss's office the next morning with my two little names that I was already going to fire anyway, and a blank for that third name, I was shaking. I ended up telling my boss exactly, basically what I told you tonight. I can't put another name on that list because it's not right. If you've got to have a third name, then you have to take me, and that's it. I was so fortunate that I worked for a boss who didn't want to lose me, <laughs> who said, it's OK, Susan. We'll just take the two names, and, and we'll move forward. But I was ready to go ahead and walk away from the job that I loved and risk the consequences because of how I felt. It was me as much as anybody else that I was concerned about. I never went back and told my team what I had done. In fact, I've never talked about that particular situation, I, I don't think, until tonight, because it was kind of relevant with this situation. But when I think about ethical dilemmas and how stressed and that cold fear of losing everything, the house, the, you know, the car, the food, the, you know, everything, I understand. I get it. I see why people will go ahead and do things that they don't feel good about. If you are that one shining light, the one who goes ahead and says, it stops here, I'm not going to do that. It makes all the difference in the world in your life. Even if people don't know that you did it, somehow people just know who you are. I mean, right. I'll add on to that leadership. I've worked for a boss that would do anything and everything to advance himself. There were, we had a mantra. At, no dead bodies left behind, and he violated that. Hmm. It was, he would stand on anybody's shoulders to just shine, rise up to the top. And one time he was going to fire someone because they basically didn't like working, them working uh, or working with that person. And I'm like, are you going to go fire this person wearing the same shoes that they bought you for your birthday? <laughs> You're taking gifts left and right. You're setting a standard. You're telling everybody that it's fair game. There are no standards. And it just, it was demoralizing. It was, what, what am I participating in? It's not the leader that I want to follow. He's a manager, somebody that manages your everyday work, making sure that you're, you're getting donuts out the door, and that's basically it. <laughs> I've worked for a, for a leader that would stand for his people. The, he's in the know. He knows everything. We wanted to make sure if something breaks, he's the first person to know because we know he's got our backs. We know I can trust this person. I know he could tell me. If I have spinach in my teeth, he would walk up to me and tell me, hey, you've got spinach in your teeth. Your breath stinks, by the way. That's the kind of boss I want to work for. He's a leader. 
I, I enjoyed working with him, and I was really, really sad to see him go. So what kind of boss do you want to be? Do you want to be a manager or a leader? Do you want to be the person that people say good riddance when they leave? Or they, <laughs> they mourn and they pain, they're in pain when, when you decide to switch and find another job? Okay. The first one, unfortunately, was fired. <laughs> there are consequences sometimes even but doing the right thing. Okay, we are at the hard stop. We want to thank you so much. Oh, we have one more from Valerie. Sorry, Valerie, you're going to let us? Okay. Okay, one, one quick comment. I work for a company that had some leaders that I believe should be in jail, but they're not, and <laughs> you the company's gone on. <laughs> but I want to work for a company that has integrity and that has ethics. And I'll be happy to read and sign any ethics statement that I need to, to keep our company afloat and to keep it good. And I want to work with people with ethics. So that's why you should have ethics, and that's why your company should have ethics. Because people trust you, and you, and you want to work for them. Well said. Thank you, thank you very much for Very that. well said. You guys have been a great audience. Yeah, you have you a so great much. night. Yeah. And rock your weeks. Thank you. Thanks for this. And we'll be around for a little while if you'd like to.